Good morning. It's so good to be here with Oh, thank you, Amanda. Always appreciate that. <laughs> Aw, we missed you too. Um, thank you for being with us here today. If you're new, welcome. We're so glad you chose to spend your Sunday morning with us. If you're watching online, we are always so glad to have you with us as well. I am a winter baby through and through. I don't know if you knew this about me. I love weekends like this, right, where it finally snowed like it was supposed to snow. I know some of you are not going to like me after that. I was born in January, and I just had great memories growing up building snow forts. And, oh, yeah, my January baby's back there. Um, I, you know, snow forts with my dad and snowball fights and sledding and all the good stuff, right? I'm a winter baby. I love the snow. I love every season, by the way, but I do love the snow. My son Henry is also a winter baby. He's five years old. He was born in March. My other two babies are actually winter babies too. But the thing is, as much as I've tried to get him excited about the snow, he's not buying it. Like, I've tried everything. We get it. This is a weird winter. You're not always going to like the snow if you've hardly experienced it. You just experience the cold. I get that. But everything I try doesn't seem to work. And, I mean, we all long for the winter or the, the winter to be gone a little bit, too. We like the warmer weather, the new life. So he's not totally out of the loop, but I love to bond with my winter babies, and he's just not falling for it. He says, before and after preschool, everywhere in between, I don't like the snow, Mommy. I don't like winter. I don't like all these things, right? Everything about the winter, he could be, winter snow, bad is, uh, winter is bad. Bad is, what am I talking about, guys? My brain is everywhere. This is what happens when I lead worship and preach on the same day. I'm sorry. But snow is bad. Winter is bad. Everything is bad when it comes to the snow. Like It made Caddy dirty. And I'm like, dude, it's not the snow's fault that you dropped Caddy in the snow. If anything, he's a little bit cleaner now. Unless it was, you know, yellow snow, which I've warned him about thoroughly. But it doesn't matter. He always puts up a fight if he gets one, you know, one slip on the ice, one ounce of snow up the sleeves. This little guy is done. He's done. He's ready for spring. He's ready for playgrounds and pools and beaches and climbing trees and sunshine. And I don't blame him because he doesn't get the whole picture yet. He doesn't see the symbolism and the beauty of the changing seasons. He's not quite there. He likes winter for one reason and one reason only, and that is Christmas. Yes. And Christmas time, is, that's a ship that's long past sailed at this point. Sometimes even when I hear his complaints, his frustrations with the winter, as a winter baby, I too just get that feeling of longing and yearning. Like, yeah, I want, I want springtime too. After months without the sun, my body also yearns for new life, for hope around the bend. Winters feel a little bit like deserts, don't they? That feeling of being in the middle of a desert and just wanting a little bit of fresh water. Or like you've been up all night and it's been the longest night of your life and you're just waiting for that sun to rise. We're in the middle end of the dead cold winter. And it's been the most mild winter probably most of us could ever have imagined. Like in my lifetime for sure, it's the most mild winter I ever remember. But it's still winter. We've barely seen the sun for months <laughs> Some of us struggle with seasonal depression. Some of us struggle with regular depression, and when that combines, it's not so fun. For some of us, we've celebrated a lot of holidays in the wintertime without the loved ones that we miss so much, and it's hard. For some of us, winter is just symbolic of all the other seasons of our lives, all the other things going on where we're longing for something, we're waiting, or we're in pain, and we're just waiting for that pain to end. All of us struggle with winter for different reasons. For many of us, though, if we're struggling mentally or socially or spiritually, imagine how much more we would be struggling if we didn't have this miraculous hope of Christ, this peace of Christ that we celebrated today. If we are struggling for water in the desert, if we're struggling for waiting on spring in the midst of winter, how much more would it be difficult for those who don't have Christ? And if we have this powerful peace available to us, like we just sang about, and we struggle holding on to morning light, how much more will it be for those who don't have that hope? I don't know where each of you are coming from today, but as we read these passages, or this passage today, I want us to ask a couple questions, no matter where you're coming from, and, and that's this. What does it look like for me to share the hope that I do have, the peace that I do have with those around me? in a way that changes both of us for the better? What does it look like for me to be that stream in the wasteland 
for somebody else, a glimpse of spring in the dead of winter. Thankfully, as always, the Bible paints a picture for us today that I think is not only going to encourage us, give us water for our thirsty souls, but also one that will challenge us to see that there's so much more we can be doing to help bring that water to somebody else. So let's dive in together. Today we're going to be in Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12, and I'm reading out of the NRSV translation. Read out of whatever translation you want. It'll also be on the screen here for you. Verse 1. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, where I, there I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and let me across again. Led me across again. This time the water was up to my knees. And after another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the, wa- the river was too deep to cross. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, have you been watching, son of man? And then he led me along the river bank. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, the river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of the stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. Fish and will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever the water flows. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea all the way to Engadi and En, uh, I'm going to botch this one, En El Glam. <laughs> the shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea just as they fill the Mediterranean. But as the, marsh- the marshes and swamps will not be purified, they will still be salty. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown or fall. And there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be food and the leaves for healing. So in order to get a more holistic perspective of this passage, we got to back it up a little bit and start at the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, where we find Ezekiel sitting by the Kibar River with the other Israelite exiles. And they've been in Babylonian captivity at this point for five years. And this is when Ezekiel starts having these prophetic visions to share with the people. The first four visions and the first half of the book of Ezekiel is filled with God's judgment to the people of Israel because they've walked away from him. Time and time again, they've chosen to worship other gods and forget what their God had done for them in the past. The first 30 chapters or so are filled with hard truths and prophetic warnings, not only about the people of Israel, but what would happen to their holy city of Jerusalem. Ezekiel tries to warn the people of impending doom and destruction because of their choices, and by 33, Jerusalem has officially fallen. The temple is ruined, and everything feels hopeless at that point. But things start taking a turn in chapter 34 with another vision and more prophetic communication between Ezekiel and the the people of Israel. The Israelites start realizing God hasn't forsaken them. He hasn't given up on them. There's hope for the people of Israel. God reveals that there's restoration around the corner. And for those who turn back to God and follow him, he will put his spirit on them and rebuild what was ruined. Then there's this classic Valley of Dry Bones vision. Do you guys, does that sound familiar? Where God takes Ezekiel to this land filled with skeletons. Just saying that name would send shivers up Henry's spines right now because he's a little afraid of skeletons. But it is a creepy scene. It's this land filled with skeletons. And and God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he tells him then to prophesy over the bones that they would breathe. And suddenly all these bones are coming to life like a real-life zombie film, except for without the zombies. <laughs> Once again, there is hope for, for Israel. God is breathing new life 
into dead bones. God is bringing hope to the hopeless once again, and once again, he's proving himself as not only the God of justice, but the God of mercy. The book continues on revealing the hope of God for the Israelites, and then it takes an interesting turn in the final vision. God has offered this hope to Israel, but it seems like this hope might not just be for Israel, as that's a theme woven throughout the whole Old Testament that we forget about. It's clear that this overarching theme is God is bringing hope and restoration to all of creation, not just for the Israelites. And God is clear that this new temple, this place that we just learned about, it's actually not Israel or the city of Jerusalem like they would expect. It's different. This dwelling place is different. God is doing a new thing. The glory, the inclusivity, the grace of God can't be contained to the geographical location of the city of Jerusalem. And it's not descriptive of Jerusalem either because we know that there is not a river running through it. According to the Bible Project, guys, this river is actually more reminiscent of the Garden of Eden, and its description matches almost perfectly to Genesis. This is a really important thing to know, even though it seems really subtle and maybe silly to notice it. But it's important because it changes our perspective and continues to encourage us of how big the story of God really is. To look outward and realize it's not all about me. It's not all about the church. It's not even all about the OG Israelites. It's about God's plan of redemption for all of humanity. The Bible Project guys sum it up while they say, we see just how cosmic Ezekiel's vision is. God's plan has always been to restore all humanity in all creation to his life-giving presence. In chapter 48, in the very last verse of the book of Ezekiel, we see that God named this city, and he names it after himself. He says the verse in verse 35 of chapter 48, and the name of the city from that time on will be the Lord is there. That reminds me so much of Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord is there. Reading our passage today gives us new meaning when we understand it in this context. Because we can notice that like the Israelites, we too make some mistakes. We sin against God. We walk away from him time and time again. But here's what we need to remember. Even in the death and destruction we choose for ourselves, God is still faithful. Even in the midst of the valley of dry bones, he is still breathing new life into our lungs. Even in the coldest winter, the driest desert, the longest night, God still wants to share his kingdom with us. He wants to share his abundance with us and be with us in this city called the Lord is there. Going back to the passage, we need to notice a few things before moving forward. And the first thing we need to notice is that God doesn't call us to stay ankle deep in our faith. Just like he doesn't call us to stay on milk and not solid food like the author of Hebrew says he wants us to go deeper. He wants us to follow him into the deeper unknown waters of trust and dependence on him. Just like Ezekiel does in the vision, right? And another thing we don't want to miss is that God's spirit purified the water so that it was full of life. This river that comes from the heart of God in the temple changed the atmosphere of the Dead Sea so that it became living in a vibrant body of water. Not again, for the first time ever, a living and vibrant body of water. Something that was always dead has come to life. At the lowest point on earth, surrounded by de deserts and completely uninhabitable by any living thing other than microbes like little bacteria, even today the Dead Sea is known to be the opposite of life in every single way. And yet, in this vision, Ezekiel confirms that even the Dead Sea will be given life and that life will flourish all around it. The Spirit of God can change even the most stubborn and inhospitable environments. And the last thing I want us to recognize is that the river of God transforms everything around it. Not just the people, but every living thing. God's river of grace and love didn't just change the waters of the old Dead Sea. It provided life to everything the river touched. Everything that came in contact with the river was changed. 
Remember what verse 9 said, wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. There will be many fish once the waters reach there. It will become fresh and everything will live where the river goes. We named our third child Ezra River. In fact, we gave all of our children very symbolic middle names, mostly because if their first name gets too popular, they have one to lean on. In our case, it they're probably so strange they wouldn't change the name even if they wanted to. But our first is Ezra River. Our five-year-old son, Henry, his middle name is Bear. And uh, that was named after Justin's grandpas. And also because even in the womb, I knew that boy was going to be strong and stubborn <laughs> and courageous. And sure enough, he's already a fierce protector of those around him and a fighter for justice. And I know that will continue. His first name is a family name, Henry, but it also means leader, and we wouldn't be surprised if he turned into one. Our three-year-old, Junia Pearl, has also got a powerhouse name. She was named after a female apostle that was highly favored by Paul. And her middle name, Pearl, is after one of my favorite people in my, in my whole world, my grandma. And because she's precious and unique and special, and we know God's going to use her in a unique way. As icing on the cake after she was born, I actually found out that my grandma, Alice Pearl, was named after her great-grandma, who was a woman preacher. And I had no idea until after I had already named her that, which was really, it was cool. It warmed both of our hearts because we're raising not only Junie, but our other kids to not let the world dictate who they become, but to let God lead them in their calling. And lastly, little Ezra River, our sweet little sunshine baby. He's going to be one year old in two days. It's unbelievable. And when we were naming him, we just wanted something to represent God's hand in our fertility journey and also just God's hand in our, in our lives as a family, in our marriage. Ezra means with God's help. And river represents the important times rivers have brought life into Justin and my relationship. We met at Houghton College and the Genesee River ran through it. And we spent so much time on that river, and then we moved to Nashville, and the Cumberland River is right there, and then we moved to the Thousand Islands, and arguably on one of the greatest rivers of all time, the St. Lawrence River. And now, we're back on the Genesee in kind of a full circle way, this time at the north end, and not the south end like Houghton. We're water people through and through, and we find a lot of imagery in water, and a lot of meaningful moments We've made memories on these rivers, the kind of memories that you can look back and just see God's faithfulness and see his hand in those moments. To us, rivers, more than any other body of water, symbolize the powerful love of God. Rivers bring fresh life. Rivers bring intensity and current. Rivers provide electricity. Rivers supply food and life wherever they go. They're not stagnant. They're ever-moving, ever-changing. Rivers are mentioned a lot in the Bible. They often symbolize God's love and grace and peace, when peace like a river, like we sang about earlier. Rivers remind us that no matter how dry it gets in the desert, no matter how thirsty we become, no matter how stagnant our lives seem, like the Dead Sea, there is always hope that God's river of joy and peace will rush in to surround us and transform us, to give us life to the full. So what do we do with this passage from today? What good does this vision from Ezekiel do for us in the 21st century? We're not exactly living in Babylonian captivity. We're not really physically uncomfortable or living in a land of desolation. Probably a lot of us passed Starbucks or Dunkin' on the way here and grabbed some. <laughs> Tim Hortons, there you go. Sorry, Timmy, so I didn't shout you out. But I think in a lot of ways... We can all be moved, like living a little bit removed from this stream of life, right? We talked about in the beginning, some of us, it's hard to even get out of bed in the morning because of depression. For some of us, we're struggling to find water in, in the middle of the desert of our spiritual lives or in the, the valleys of our mental health battles. How can this passage today encourage us? I think it's all agreeing that the good news is found in verse 9. Life will flourish where the river flows. It's good news for you. It's good news for me. It's good news for our community. Because if you're struggling with anxiety today, you can remember that there's peace where the river flows. If you're suffering with doubt, you can take heart that there is truth and there is faith where the river flows. 
if you are grieving or in pain, if you're depressed, be encouraged that there is comfort where the river flows. For your friend battling loneliness, for your family member fighting financial trouble, there is hope where the river flows. There is life, there is joy, there is abundance. There is enough for all of us where the river flows. So let the river of God flourish you. And let God use that river flowing back out of you to flourish everyone around you. Today as you go home, tomorrow as you wake up, next month as you face a new challenge that you're not expecting, remind yourself that you have access to this river that flows from God's throne. This river that flows from the very heart of God is accessible to you. For our time of worship today, I was really close to having us sing that old camp song. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. It makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. You know that song? It's a good one. It brings back a ton of good memories. But I think that song's a little incomplete because it starts by talking about this power that can make the blind to see, to open prison doors and set the captives free. And then it turns really inward in the chorus. Spring up a well within my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me that life abundantly. I don't think those are bad things to pray over ourselves. I think we should be praying those things over ourselves, but it can't stop there. It can't. Because if it stops there, we're hoarding away the grace and the love and the mercy and the joy and the favor of God. We have to spread it. We want it to flow out of us into the lives of everyone around us. We want to be those cups that overflow, that we just can't help but share the love that we've experienced from the river of God into everyone around us. This is one of the things that the Israelites were actually especially guilty of. They were prone to wander from God, but they were also prone to disobey his decrees, to love everyone, to change the atmosphere around them, to welcome the stranger, to help the poor. They were disobedient in following God in the hard moments of life. They continued to see themselves at the center of all of God's plan when really God's desire and what he reveals in the Old Testament over and over again is that his love is for all people. Which leads us to our fourth goal of seven. If you haven't been with us the last few weeks, we've been in a sermon series called Live Love. Out of our mission statement, we want to live and love like Jesus. And we've also been talking about these seven goals that we have over the next seven years before our church turns 100. And we've talked about three goals already, so I'll just remind you of those in case you've forgotten. They're, it's easy to forget when you just hear them a couple times, but the first is that we want to see a hundred people come to know Jesus and be baptized. Come to know Jesus and be baptized. The second is we, we want to create a group for everyone to belong. For everyone to find connection and growth. The third goal is that we want to be open seven days a week and provide a third space for our community. To be available, to have our doors opened. And our fourth goal, the one that we're focusing on today, is in seven years, we will be known for our, in our community for our partnership and our participation. Our passage today didn't just make us reflect on our personal experiences with this river or even our corporate experiences with this river. It also reminds us that the river of life is going to go everywhere. It's going to bring life to everyone it touches. And it's our job as individuals and as a church to be an extension of that river to bring life and hope to everything and everyone we touch. To embrace our duty and our circles of influence, to live in love like Jesus so that others can know him too. John Henry says, significantly, the river does not come from a king's palace or a government building. It, comes, it doesn't come from a marketplace, a place of business, or an athletic arena. It comes from God's house. And when I hear that, all I can hear is Henry's little four-year-old, almost five-year-old voice in my head saying, Mommy, I love God's house. <laughs> that warms our heart because it's been a challenge when you're pastors and you have little kids. They're in the church a lot. Sometimes they don't want to be here. Let's be real. 
they're amazing, but we've had to teach them that we want to love other people like Jesus did, right? And one of our areas of ministry is here in this, in this church. And so he's really grown a fondness to be here, and that's what he says almost every time he's here now is, Mommy, I love God's house. As he learns that good things happen here, as we follow God, as we work alongside God to bring goodwill to this earth, and he knows that God lives in us too. But it's really beautiful to see how his four-year-old brain understands it. And honestly, I just love that he believes and he knows that God lives here at City Hope. The river doesn't come from a king's palace or a government building. It comes from God's house. It comes from here. It comes from us. It comes from the heart of God and it flows in and through us as we follow him, as we emulate him to the rest of the world in everything we do. Life will flourish where the river flows and we hope to bring that life into our community in every way we can. We want to be known not as a church that is desperate to grow in numbers or make the most amount of money and tithe or have the biggest staff or the showiest property We want to be known for our love for those around us. We want to be known in our community as a community partner, as a church that is so full of love and generosity and hospitality and compassion and service that it overflows into our community and that it changes everything around us. We want to participate alongside, join ranks with, and serve the people of Gates, New York. And it won't be easy. It really won't be easy, guys. Because there's going to be a difference in culture. There's going to be a difference in beliefs, language, lifestyles, economic backgrounds. There's going to be a difference in priorities and preferences. But that's okay. Because just as the Son of Man came to serve and not to be served and give his life as a ransom for many, so will we at City Hope choose to be conduits of the river of God, bringing life and health and joy and peace everywhere we go and to everything we touch. God, let it be so. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to to be in this place, to be with your people, to, to be in a place that is safe, where we can learn about you freely, where we can be surrounded with other people who are just on the journey, Lord. Maybe there's some here that don't even know you personally, and that's okay, Father, because you are pursuing them, and you love them. Lord, no matter where anyone's at in their journey with you, Father, you are right there alongside them. You know what they're struggling with. You know what they're going through. You know the battles they've already faced. You know the battles to come. You know every hair on their head because you created them. You love them. So, Father, I pray right now that you would minister to every heart in this room, every heart that's watching online, every heart that wasn't able to be with us today because they're traveling or they're sick. Lord, I pray that you would meet us exactly where we are, that you would remind us that you love us so much, that you have this river that's available to us that is filled with abundance and peace and comfort and joy and hope. Father, in the darkest night, in the deadest valley, in the darkest winter, you are here with us. You are among us. And we trust that you will be faithful to the end. Lord, I pray that we would put our lives in your hands, that we would trust you, that we would believe that you have greater things for us, that you have greater things for this city, that you have greater things for this world as we just live into the purpose that you've created us for, which is to love you and love others. Father, I pray that we would multiply. I pray that we would just share you with everyone we meet and everything we touch like the river does that we would bring life and health and joy and peace and healing. Lord, that we would bring reconciliation and a willingness to fight for things that are hard. I pray for resilience. Father, I pray for resilience over our people because it's not going to be easy when we do this. It's not always comfortable. There's swimming involved. There's not just ankle deep faith. 
So Father, I pray that you would fill our spirits with more of you and less of us. I pray that you would surround us and encourage us and strengthen us to be resilient because every person deserves to have the hope of Christ, not just for the future, but for here and now. Every person deserves to hear the message that you are faithful, that you are here. So may we be faithful to that, Lord. May we be faithful to the mission to spread your love. But Father, I will pray a special healing over those who are really struggling right now, struggling in their mental health, struggling in their spiritual health or their physical health, Lord. I pray healing over their bodies, over their minds, over their hearts. I pray that you would free them from whatever bondage they are in that they would recognize that they have life and they have life to the full with you no matter what else is going on. But Lord, I pray for those circumstances as well. I pray that you would lift the burdens of physical stress, of emotional stress. Lord, I pray that your life would usher in, that your healing waters would reach to even the smallest veins and the tiniest pains in our bodies. Lord, I pray that you would just miraculously empower our bodies to fight this fight as well, to be resilient, to be strong. I pray for those who are grieving, who have lost ones that will never come back this side of heaven. I pray that you would just comfort them in a unique and deep way, that you would minister to their spirits. Father, I pray for this entire group of wonderful people here, Lord. I pray that your will would be done, that you would minister to each of them in the way that they need desperately from you. And I pray, Father, that you would unify us together, that we would become closer as brothers and sisters, not without conflict, but with conflict that breeds new life and new unity, Lord. Lord, I just, I pray strength over this body, Father. I pray that every individual person here would would take the challenge of walking into their lives and their circles of influence and just spreading you like wildfire. We thank you for your faithfulness, Jesus. We thank you for your truth, for your grace that sets us free. We praise you and we love you and we trust you in Jesus' name.